used. Whereas in the right explosives, we have sufficient material which we can analyze as per the laid down uh, standard operating procedures for the quality control of the quality assurance of the explosive uh, material. And this is all formulated by the uh, Ministry of Defense. In their, they have a best laboratory in Khadki near Pune, where uh, controller of uh, uh, quality assurance military explosives. So they carry out. But occasionally in the forensic laboratory also, we get the live explosives. So generally our job in the forensic laboratories is not to handle the live explosives. Very rarely that it is the small portion of the uh, explosive device that we require for analysis. Occasionally it is required to find out the geographical origin of the explosive. Whether this particular explosive was manufactured in India or our neighboring countries like uh, China, Pakistan or any other country. For example, in the uh, 1993 scissors, we got certain hand grenades which did not have any markings. But we found that they were of Italian, Italian origin. And uh, the RDX which was used in the 1993 blast was of Zeko Slovakian region, that is for the dismemberment of the cigar. Zeko Slovakia manufactured this RTX and this was about 35 tons, 35 tons, 35 tons of which was smuggled to Libya. <laughs> Please switch off your mic. Don't disturb. 35 tons of RDX was smuggled to Libya and and the leak and from Libya uh, it came to India. So that was, was how we found out in the Bombay blast case. It was a plastic explosive which was by the people who bombed Bombay at that time. They mixed carbon black in that and it was black. The, whereas the Zekoswayakin explosive was orange in color because they had mixed with the polymer uh, orange dye. In our laboratory, we separated all those things and identified the dye which was used. And from the, and from the data bank, uh, of the Defense Ministry, we found out that this particular dye was used in Zekoslovakia. That's how the geographical origin can be found out. Many times, you know, the composition from country to country varies, and therefore we can find out those things by the what we call detailed quantitative analysis. In the explosion residue analysis, rarely they require quantitative analysis because it is meaningless. In the live explosives only it is possible and uh, it is done and for, for geographical origin also. Many techniques are available for that. For example, isotope ratio, mass spectrometry and uh, uh, other techniques are available by means of which we can find out the uh, origin of the somebody is scratching on my PPTs. Please don't do that. Uh. Now, present scenario as I was talking to you just now. Explosives are basically manufactured for industrial, commercial and military purposes. Like 
breaking the rocks or in the mining industry making roads and uh, bridges etc explosives are used and major major consumption of certain types of explosives are in the military for our self defense at one time the military power and the industrial prosperity and development of a nation was measured in terms of the tonnage of explosives which a particular country or a nation produced next still scratching is going on the misuse the misuse and abuse of explosives for other than the whole legitimate purposes like mining and uh, road whitening and uh, breaking the rocks and also sometimes well well digging etc so they are legitimate purposes as per the explosive laws under life those activities are given to the people other than that criminal and terrorist activity in the recent years killing large number of people and destroying properties has necessitated necessitated the development uh, of laboratories which is useful for the law enforcement and criminal justice system these methods which we have developed also look into preemptive and preventive measures to detect hidden explosives before the criminal act for example when an explosive is being transported in a vehicle or in a bus public transport railways or a fuse which are used to detect the explosive like ion mobility spectrometry etc mass spectrometry etc which is used to find out the hidden explosives various baggages which the people carry with them and of course sniffer dogs are also used for this purpose now explosives are substances that are undergo a rapid oxidation reaction with the production of large quantities of gas this is very important to understand that in itself chemical reaction itself is not dangerous but the amount of gases they produce are most dangerous because they create what is known as shock wave enormous amount of gases are released it is the sudden build up of gas pressure that constitute the nature of explosion this not the fire
Now, the amount of oxygen which is present in a molecule um, may be just sufficient to uh, burn the all the carbon present. That is, which we call um, uh, as a oxygen balance yeah, in the molecule. Now, in the, the amount of oxygen balance, which is present is in a molecule equal um, may be equal just sufficient to uh, burn the all the carbon. For present. example, that if I see the smoke, um, which is produced by the explosion itself, we can identify the amount of oxygen, oxygen which is present in a molecule. For example, when TNL exploding, just sufficient to is black smoke. The reason we all the carbon the example, if I see the number of carbon which is produced by the explosion itself, and then the the amount of oxygen, 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 oxygen for example when the uh, uh, so what happens is just if you write to black smoke that the number of carbon the amount of oxygen the amount of oxygen and then the amount of oxygen the amount of oxygen and then the amount of oxygen the amount of oxygen and then 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 the amount of oxygen and that means the amount of oxygen available is enough to burn all the carbon atoms in the RDX molecule. As we can see the pictures of Rajiv Gandhi assassination, a white cloud was there. A chemical chemical explosion is a chemical reaction we can define the explosion like the chemical explosion is a chemical reaction in which gas is released first condition is gas is released and then energy is released in the form of heat light and pressure and both one and two are released very rapidly now you burn something. Then also gas is released, then also energy is released. But we can't call it as a explosion. They must be released very rapidly, then only we can call it an explosion. Now I'll show you some pictures of the explosions. Now this is a picture in Hyderabad. We had Wilson Nader, last famous case, which was handled by NIA, and uh, people were caught and punished. And uh, this is a uh, place where the explosion happened. Terrorists had to. This is an explosion in Bombay, 1993. Uh, blast, one of the scenes. There are serious blasts there. Every half an hour, there was an explosion. There were 11, uh, 10 or 11 places where the explosion took place. So this is uh, also a Bombay blast of 1993 at Worli. There are so many places which took place. I am showing you a couple of pictures so that. This is a called Murrah building in the Oklahoma in USA. And this is a terrorist activity. We can see that how a building is damaged and how many people were killed. In Bombay Blast, so many people were killed. And this is also, uh, a, there was a blast in Gokul Chat Bhandar in Hyderabad. Gokul Chat. So there, this is the uh, picture of that. This is again the 1993 Bombay blast. This is uh, uh, near Air India building. Next. So some of the pictures I have shown, I have hundreds of uh, things. Chemical reaction or change of state. 
affected in exceedingly short period of time the generation of high temperature and generally a large quantity of gas. An explosion produces a shock wave in the surrounding medium. A shock wave uh, is the amount of pressure which is exerted on the environment by the released gases because the uh, amount of gases which are released are so enormous, thousands of times more, and then the normal pressure in the atmosphere is 760 mm. But this increases the pressure by several, one atmosphere is that, and uh, it will be 20, 30, 40, hundreds of atmosphere of pressure. That pressure is so powerful that whatever comes in its way, it will be shattered to pieces or uh, building, whether it is him or a person or anything. A person may be thrown several uh, hundred feet away. So that is the power of an uh, explosive. An explosive train. So we call as explosive train is a triggering sequence of events that leads to the detonation of the explosives. There are low explosives and high explosives. With the low explosives being the most sensitive to detonate, the high explosives are the most difficult to detonate for the safety. Low explosives, though they cause very little damage, but they are very sensitive to uh, impact or the spark or whatever. Whereas high explosives, even if you burn, they don't explode. Later, you will know why this happens. Next. This is the explosive train. There are called as one, two, and three, and four step explosive uh, train. So if you see in the uh, left hand side picture one, so there is the main charge is shown as a red, and the primary high explosives like PETN is put, and when the, the primary explosive is ignited by electrical or flame or whatever, then there is a mini explosion there, PTN. And that shock wave produced by that particular mini explosion is capable of exploding the main charge. If you light it with a matchstick, it won't explode. It requires a explosion. It requires a shock wave of a intensity explosion. In the second picture below that, we have what is known as three-stage explosion, where we have first a safety fuse, because the length of the fuse determines the time it will take for exploding the bomb. Because you can ignite that and run away, so that you get the time to go away from the scene. So therefore, a, a fuse is there. The length of fuse determines the time it will take to explode a particular bomb. Then the second uh, thing, the blue one, which we have there, is another explosive which is kept over there. And uh, that the fuse will ignite the primary explosive, which is shown as a blue. And then the red explosive is the main charge like nitrogen. Uh, gelatin or RDX, etc. And the right side, we have a fourth stage where again we have a safety fuel, high explosive, and then we have a secondary high explosive or what we call it as a booster. So, and then we have the uh, main charge like ANFO. ANFO means ammonium nitrate fuel oxide booster, which is now mostly replaced gelatin. Next. One click it should do. A detonation is confined explosion. If you take a gunpowder and burn it on a in a dish, it will simply burn without causing an explosion. If the same gunpowder is kept in a box, closed box, and then ignited, then an explosion will occur. So, in confined state, 
the explosives will explode. So the detonation, uh, it is called an ex the explosion which is occurring when a, an explosive is confined and uh, ignited. That is called the detonation. In a closed chamber where volume is constant, an unconfined explosion is an explosion occurring in the open air where the atmospheric pressure is constant. Whereas if you want to explode the RDX, etc., it does not require confinement. It will explode itself without confinement. So when it occurs in the confined, we call it a detonation. Next. The most widely explosives in low explosives group are black powder, that is the gunpowder, which is a mixture of potassium, nitrate, sulfur, and carbon. And smokeless powder, which is a mixture of uh, this uh, black gunpowder and nitrocellulose. Strangely enough, just like Chinese have invented corona, Chinese also have invented gunpowder in the around about 1000 AD in China while experimenting uh, with alchemists, Chinese alchemists, when they were uh, doing some uh, for, uh, research for medicines with potassium nitrate and sulfur. Accidentally, uh, there was uh, carbon got mixed and then it exploded. And they did not forget just as an accident, but they investigated and discovered the gunpowder for the first which traveled to uh, Europe and uh, Mughals, etc. By 12th century, uh, everybody knew in the Europe, etc. And it was for the what this reason that Mughals could enter India because Babas had the gunpowder with him, whereas the Ibrahim Lodi did not have any problem. And though his uh, army was three times more than that of the father, because of the firepower and artillery which they had had. So it be black powder is a mixture of potassium or sodium nitrate, charcoal and sulfur. Smokeless powder consists of, as I told you, nitrocellulose is called single base are nitrocellulose and nitroglycerin. That is gunpowder, nitrocellulose and nitroglycerin. It is called as double base. And some of these are used. So it is potassium nitrate or sodium nitrate plus charcoal plus sulfur. It's heavy. And uh, the structures below are that of nitrocellulose. Cellulose in an is having a lot of OH groups, so it is an alcoholic in nature. So that is nitrocellulose. And uh, the right side you see the two structures, they are of nitroglycine. Nitroglycine is having, uh, it is a trihydroxy alcohol. So all the three nitrogens are replaced by nitrogen. I mean, all the three of OH groups are replaced by nitro groups, and then we have this nitrate. Glycerin is uh, treated with nitrating mixture, and then it gets nitrated uh, one after the other. All the OH groups are replaced, and we get the uh, nitroglycerin. So this structurally uh, the other way of expressing, showing the nitro groups as well, showing certain positive values from the nitro groups. Next. Among the high explosives, primary explosives are ultra sensitive to heat, shock, or friction, and provide the major ingredients found in the blasting caps or the primer used to determine other explosives. For example, in the guns, what we use, 
the trigger hits a particular point where the primary explosive is kept, you will uh, know what are the primary explosives. Then the secondary explosives are relatively insensitive to heat, shock or friction and will normally burn rather than detonate if ignited in small quantities in the open air. This group comprises the majority of commercial and military blasting explosives such as dynamite, TNT, ETN, and RDX. So, this is the structure of TNT trinitrotolving, 246 trinitrotolving. And uh, this is the right side. We have the structure of PETN, penta, erythritol, tetra, nitrate. It is uh, used in booster charges and it's very, uh, gives a very powerful shock. This is RDX. This is the cyclo trinitrine trinitramine, which is popularly known as RDX. That is research development compound X, uh, named uh, during the Second World War by the British Navy. So next, so we have understood what is explosion. By the definition of explosion, we can describe an explosive, which is same definition. Capable of producing gas, capable of producing energy, and one and two are must occur rapidly, and one, two, three are self sustaining. Self sustaining means it continues till the end. For example, if you are having a, a wood, wooden hull there, you have to go on putting wood in that. Here, in this case, in the case of explosion, you don't have to supply oxygen or anything else. So the reaction itself is self-sustaining. Yes, now we'll quickly classify the explosives. Explosives uh, can be different types of explosions are there. They are physical, chemical, and atomic. So physical explosions are mechanical, such as gas cylinder bursts or compressor explosives. This is because of the mechanical reasons. If we are not going to do that mostly, we don't have to do any uh, chemical analysis for these kind of cases. Most important for us is the chemical explosion. Explosive substances uh, are used for the chemical explosion, as we have been discussing. Last one is the atomic fission, which is beyond the scope of the current cyclomonetary. The atomic uh, uh, atomic center, for example, the, those people will be used. Now we will see what are the explosive substances uh, which we commonly use chemical explosives, including pyrotechnics. Pyrotechnics are the cracker composition that we use in the world. So they are called pyrotechnics, which are used for signaling purposes in the army. So we have primary explosives. Only four are known. Uh, there are many other are known, but commonly used. These are lead aside, mercury fulminate, lead siphonate and diazonitrophenone. So these are very sensitive. So to carry transport or use it. So they are used in very small quantities which are uh, used for primary. They are very shock sensitive, uh, very to spark or the, uh, what do you call, impact, uh, they are sensitive. Then secondary explosives, we have A, military explosives like trinitrotolvine, I have shown you the structures of all these just now, RDX, ETN, 
when I read down, I said, then tetrile, the structure of which I showed you shortly, which is used in hand grenades. B, commercial explosives, like gelatin. Gelatin is nitroglycerin. Powders, permitted explosives, ammonium nitrate and fuel oil, fuel oil emulsions and spurries. So, gelatin is very important because the history of explosives will be incomplete. If we don't take the name of Alfred Nobel, who discovered the gelatin, because nitroglycerin was, was very, very sensitive. So its sensitivity was removed by uh, by mixing sawdust and uh, calcium carbonate and so many other compounds, material, so that its sensitivity is reduced and it can be filled in sticks and gelatin sticks are used uh, in the commercial as commercial explosives and uh, the money which he made so much money he made and uh, he had no heirs so he, he this nobel prize he, he said that the money must be used for the nobel prize strangely enough well, the mystery nobel prize is given but not given for chemistry of explosives. Then three is the propellant, which are used in the gun propellant. Again, the single base and double base powders, black powder, single base and double base, and triple base powders are used. And there are rocket propellants in which we have double base composite we can use, and uh, liquid fuels like hydrogen and oxygen are used, and certain oxidizers are used. Now, this is another the classification explosive based on the chemical structure. Organic nitro explosives, they are based on the nitro group, nitro aromatics like 2,4 dinitrotolvene, 2,4,6 dinitrotolvene, and citric acid. They are phenols, trinitrophenols. Then B, nitrate esters. Esters are salts of alcohol and acid. So ethylene glycol dinitrate. Glycol is a, a alcohol and when it is uh, treated with nitric acid, we get two groups getting uh, glycol. It is having two groups getting stress and EGDN we get. Nitroglycerin uh, is uh, uh, prepared from glycerin, it is having three OH groups of three nitro groups of it. Penta is a troll, tetranitro. Penta is a troll, uh, is a uh, five OH groups are there. That is why penta is a troll, and all the five groups are substituted by nitro group. Nitrocellulose is a cellulose, it is obtained from cotton, and from uh, in that it has got a lot of OH groups. And those OH groups, OH groups, uh, those OH groups are substituted. We have CATP and HMTD. These are two explosives which is commonly used by the uh, terrorists. Which here, for example, I will show you structure in a moment. There are Inorganic salts which are used and explosive most uh, predominantly and maximum the ammonium nitrate is there, which is also used as a fertilizer. This ammonium nitrate is mostly now being used for all practical commercial purposes and uh, it has been uh, replaced, it has replaced the uh, nitroglycerin dynamite. Because the process manufacturing is very uh, difficult and very hazardous, therefore ammonium nitrate is being used. Ammonium nitrate is mixed with five percent of fuel oil, like diesel and other oils, and then with the help of a detonator, it explodes and it produces uh, a great uh, uh, 
destroying the plant. Then mixtures of oxidizing and reducing substances like black powder, potassium chloride, plus sugar, potassium chloride plus arsenic sulfide or antimony sulfide or potassium permanganate. These are the compositions which are generally used in the country bombs, which are very small, which damage only localized damage they produce. They don't produce you know, very high damage because they are uh, coming in the category of the low explosive. Mostly they are impact sensitive. So throw down bomb, quickly bomb, which we call, or country bomb, which we call. Uh, many parts of India, especially in uh, Andhra Pradesh, in Kalapa district, and also in Bihar and other places, these country bombs are very commonly used. With, they are impact sensitive. And other compounds are also used in the explosives. They are called sensitizers, desensitizers, stabilizers, like diphenylamine and ethyl centralite, and plasticizers like phthalates and sebaceous set esters and other compounds. Now we can classify based on the use also. We will quickly go through military explosives as the name indicates. They are used by the military, dinitrocalvin and uh, pentahydrin, tralcetamide, RDS, tetrite, etc. Then industrial explosives, dynamite, ammonium nitrate, inertions. And then improvised explosive devices, which are used mostly by the criminal, for criminal activities and uh, for the terrorist activities. PATP, triacetone, trichloroxide, HMPG, chlorate, sugar, chlorate, arsenic, sulfide mixtures in the pipe bombs. So these are the structures of. These are, this is the uh, left side, what we see the structure of tetrile, which is a high explosive, which is put in the hand grenades. And the right side, what we see is uh, RDX. Next. Then place in the detonation chain. Let us skip this primary explosive, let us write mercury to the and I will go migrate and all that. Uh, then, based on the high explosive properties, PT and RDS, low explosives, and all that. So, let us skip this classification because there are various ways of classification. What we are interested in is the mechanical system. Explosive materials often decompose at rate much below the sonic velocity. Explosive materials often decompose at a rate much below the sonic velocity of the material without requiring any introduction of the atmosphere oxygen. Without requiring any introduction of responsible oxygen that we discussed earlier, this type of reaction is known as deflagration. It is propagated by the heat of reaction, like radiation and convection. And this reaction is slower than the detonation velocity is slower than 1500 meters per second. Explosive reactions which are propagated by the thermal conduction and radiation are known as deflagration. These terms are to be remembered 
the direction of flow of the reaction products is opposite to that of the decomposition propagation, as we see in the barrel of the gun. The burning of the powder or of a rocket charge is deflagration process. Detonation is a chemical reaction. Deflagration, you have understood. Detonation is a chemical reaction given by an explosive substance in which produces a shock wave. High temperature and pressure gradients are generated in the wave front so that the chemical reaction is initiated instantaneously. Detonation velocities lie in the higher region, approximate range of 1500 to 9000 meters per second. A train of combustible and explosive elements arranged in order of decreasing sensitivity. We call it as explosive train, which I have already shown you. Explosive train accomplishes the controlled augmentation of a small impulse into one suitable energy to actuate main charge. So this we have explained you that if you see the explosive train from the left hand side to right hand side, their sensitivity decreases and the uh, power increases. Yes. What is a shock wave? Intense compressive wave produced by detonation of explosives is called a shock wave. I have described what is a shock wave. The enormous amount of the pressure which the gases produce is called the shock wave. So now we come to our real uh, subject. Um, of analysis and examination of the flow. So, what first of all, what are what is the purpose of examining the explosives in a forensic laboratory or at the field to confirm the identity of the suspect explosive? Then to compare an explosive with the explosive with the which is in the possession of the suspect or suspects. Then to identify the material involved in the explosion, which will determine or criminal or sometimes intention. No. For example, a lot of explosives get accumulated in the forensic laboratory. Sometimes we have to take all that stock and destroy it with the proper permission and all that. So that is called the intentional. So we best way of uh, keeping the explosive is by destroying it. Because we have seen that in police stations and the laboratories, many explosive exhibits have exploded and caused damage. So therefore, it is better to destroy them. Then examination of explosives continues to confirm the identity of suspect explosives. To compare an explosive with the explosive with the suspect to identify the material involved explosion to reconstruct the improvised explosive device. So to the court or to the law enforcement agencies, we have to demonstrate the whole thing. So we have to reconstruct the improvised explosive device. Maybe a various uh, explosive devices which are used. Then during the course of examination, we require intact explosives. Therefore, we get the intact recovery of stolen explosives. So many people steal explosives. This happens in mining areas where the lot of explosives are used in the mines. They are to steal them and play back the market. So places we have in the mining areas, you know, and farm shops, the detonators are available. Then undercover purchase, the police. Law enforcement agencies and military 
uh, they uh, go and uh, uh, in plain clothes they go and then they purchase uh, to catch the culprits who are selling these things. They are, that is called undercover purchase. Disarmed live explosives. So when live explosives are found, they are uh, deactivated and then we have to uh, analyze them. Then there are called hoax devices. A thing looks like a gelatin stick or any other bomb or a grenade, etc. But actually there is nothing. Just to uh, create a fear among the people, we have analyzed several such things in the Naxalite areas uh, where folks devices planted so that people fear. And uh, next more, most important things which you receive in the forensic laboratories is the post explosion. After the explosion has occurred, the most important thing which we have to do is we collect the residues from the scene of explosion and take to the laboratory and analyze as to what kind of explosion is there. It's a rather very difficult job and uh, uh, ordinary people who go to the crime scene like the constables or magistrates, they cannot do the job. Generally, a uh, scientist with experience in this area have to visit that and collect the explosion because the uh, explosion residues will be very small. In inorganic explosives, which are small explosions, or but in the ANFO explosion, which are very big, we get uh, a, a little more material uh, residues, we get more residues. Whereas in the case of organic explosives, everything is converted into the gas. Therefore, we will not get any residue of the after post explosion. But the container in which it is kept, when the explosion takes place, the container is broken apart, and that container contains small particles of the original explosion. So we analyze the post explosion residues from the debris of the accidental explosion or debris from the criminal bombing and debris from intentional detonation. In the research work, our manufacturing process, sometimes we create, create the uh, intentional explosives. So explosives are classified as high end of this. We can skip. We have already seen this. Velocities are there low explosive 400 meters to uh, uh, meters per second, and the amount of pressure is 30,000 uh, pounds per square inch. Yes. Okay. So, various explosives which are there. the high explosives, on the other hand, they uh, the velocities are very high, 1,000 to 8,500 meters per second, and millions of pounds of square inch uh, pressure they execute. So, next. classification we have already seen. Next. I'll take this slide because we are all, already explained this. Uh, military explosive TNT, RDX, HMX, they are combination including TTN, etc., etc. And IDs, they use, as I told you earlier, also triacetone, peroxide, chlorate, fissure, nitrobenzene, pipe bombs, etc., which the terrorists use. Swiss chemist Alfred Nobel created pulp dynamite. Uh, about the information is about. Uh, given given about the dynamics, various things, what are the things you can do, various types of dynamics. 
oxygen rich ammonium nitrate is mixed with fuel to form low pox and very stable explosive nowadays this is being used maximum water gel emulsion and and for explosives they have consistency of gel gel or gel toothpaste they are water resistant and are good for blocking under in wet condition like you know uh, deepening of wells etc and uh, there are a lot of paper reports recently uh, about the failed pulwama like attack uh, in kashmir uh, some papers said that it is rdx some papers said that it is ammonium nitrate next so uh, the ammonium nitrate mixed with oil and water and uh, here the fuel ammonium nitrate soaked in fuel oil so fertilizer grade ammonium nitrate is being used for country bombs because in the real explosives which are sold by in the commercially they use the purified ammonium nitrate special explosive grade they make whereas uh, the terrorists use the fertilizer grade ammonium nitrate so efficiency will be reduced but they are not concerned with a lot of explosions have taken place using ammonium nitrates in the uh, Khalistan movement time there was an explosion in an cinema theater uh, where ammonium nitrate was used and uh, for uh, starting the explosion they had used a cigarette so the people have entered the theater in the interval uh, they have put this explosive back contain ammonium nitrate and a detonator and to this a uh, burning cigarette is attached because uh, in villages etc no smoking is allowed uh, so it should not be allowed so an explosion like where 11 people were killed so there are a lot of uh, things which we found in those uh, so suddenly said it was a time bomb but it actually part which people were uh, individuals were wearing the waters so it was actually a simple ammonium nitrate and a detonator and a cigarette bomb. And uh, we had predicted because that was a sort of a terrorist activity that similar explosions can take place there. And uh, exactly after a couple of weeks, there was a similar explosion in Karnataka in Beaver town in a theater in a similar way, where almost the same number of people were uh, killed in that particular uh, explosion. So the ammonium nitrate can be used uh, by the terrorists. So I was talking about triacetro trioxide, which is um, which is uh, used by the terrorists. It is a homemade explosive used by terrorists in many countries. It consists consists of mixture of acetone and hydrogen peroxide and an acid. It does not contain mixture, but from these ingredients, the uh, PATP is made. Friction and impact sensitivity. If you throw, it will explode. Extremely potent when confined in a uh, container or a pipe. Next. The 2000 time uh, London blast, they use the this is structure of PATP. You see that there is no nitro group in this, so, but still it is an explosive compound, unstable. Triacetone triperoxide. Here comes in the definition of peroxide explosives. Only about a dozen of liquid or fluid start some from peroxides. All perox most of the peroxides are explosive. Others are made from nitroglycerin and nitromethane, the fuel for drag race cars. Research is going on to detect liquid explosives rapidly and efficiently at airports. Because after the some air accidents, you know, there was a ban on carrying liquids in, in the aircraft because of this reason, because somebody may carry a liquid explosive and uh, explode. Uh, 
how it is. We hear a lot about the RDX, the most popular and powerful military explosive, as well as used by the high grade terrorists, often encountered in the form of a pliable plastic or duct like consistency known as a composition C4 or plastic explosive. That means they mix with a polymer and uh, they can color it as they like. TNT is not used and used in World War II. It is used in shells, bombs, grenades, demolition explosives, and propellant composition. PETN is used an explosive core in detonating part used to connect a series of detonators, detonate simultaneously. So it is just like a wire, which, which can be taken to any distance. Next. Are hmm. So I am showing you just some new compounds. CL20, ONC, and NHNA. For organic chemistry, it will be of interest that these are known as stage compounds. These are new explosives uh, and which the military has experimented upon. They are uh, very useful and they have some additional properties, mean better properties than that of the RDX and FMS. They are high explosives. Just for example, sample thing. They are called cage compounds. They look like a cage. Nitro. They are all nitro compounds. Oh, next. Detonators are used for as a secondary explosives, which are capable of exploding the main charge. In most cases, detonators are blasting caps made of copper or aluminium cases filled with Metazite, which is a primary explosive, and PTN or RDX, which is very high explosive in small quantity as a detonating star because they produce very high um, what shock wave, which is capable of exploding the main charge. Suppose you take a high explosive and burn it, it will simply burn, it will not explode. To explode that, we require a a shock wave of high intensity. So uh, that is why we require compounds like PTLs. Improvised explosive devices or homemade bombs, camouflage in packages, suitcases, etc., are usually initiated with an electric blasting cap wired to a battery. So book bomb is there, transistor bomb is there, spectral bomb. So anyway, it is generally they use small watch cell batteries like that, and then with the help of that they, they are. So the triggering mechanism includes clocks, mercury switches, and cars are also used as electrical sources. As soon as ignition key is uh, switched on, the explosion takes place. Let's pass. This is a picture of detonator and detonating parts. This is the internal, um, you know, construction of the uh, detonator, and this is the cord, which is the long wire. You can see it can be connected. So uh, this is what is called. So you can see that shell is there, base charge is there, and uh, we have the ignition charge is there. So oh, they start with copper oxide and all that. So this are used. P10 is used in most of the detonators nowadays. Next. This is called the explosive train, you know, detonator, and then the detonating pod and the main uh, bomb explosion, main charge. Next. In recent years, NG based dynamic is disappearing. As I told you, ammonium nitrate is being used in many countries. The accessibility of the military high explosive weapons 
organization make them very important actions of the IEDs. So RDX is most popular and powerful of the military explosives often encountered in the form of pliable plastic known as C4. The entire bomb site must be systematically researched with great care to into recovering any trace or detonating mechanism or any other foreign to explode objects or near the origin of the explosion must be collected for the world area. We don't get the explosive residue, but we get the parts of the detonator which are metallic and all that. From that also we can uh, draw a lot of conclusions. After often a crater is located by the origin and loose soil and other debris must be preserved from its interior. So wherever explosion takes place, there is a crater, a big uh, puddle which is there. Uh, that is called the sea section, where there is likely hook up from the explosion. One approach for screening objects for explosives is the, is the field or laboratory uh, is the ion mobility spectrometer. Next. Preliminary identification of explosives is made by ion mobility spectrometry by noting the time it takes the explosive to make you a tube, a confirmatory test of it. That is the uh, substance ions are made. Uh, substance are ionized and then those ions move with different speeds depending on their molecular weight and then they are detected by that. All materials collected for the examination that the world must be placed in a sealed airtight container and labeled with an all pertinent information. Debris and uh, articles collected from different areas are to be packed separately in airtight containers. Next. So, as I told you earlier, analysis of light intact explosives, analysis of explosion. Next. Most important thing is the extraction process. If you extract properly, you can get the result. So, after extraction, we do the qualitative analysis by spot test, like uh, spot tests we do, then similar chromatography, infrared, and Raman spectroscopy can be DC, HPLC, MS, DC, MS, LC, MS, ion mobility spectrometry, NMR, and uh, XRB. Most Analytical instrumentation as used for the qualitative analysis. Then quantification for purity and origin we can do by UVs, fluorescence, HPLC, HPLC in the light explosion. In the case of light, then profiling we can do by UVs, spectroscopy, DC, HPLC, etc. That profiling means all the impurities present also quickly. UV visible spectrophotometry is very useful in the live explosive analysis because many of them are aromatic and they have a UV4. So from that we can uh, do the quantification. Use, but in the useful to a limited extent with the advent of chromatographic method, purification necessary because pure compound must be there for the UV spectrometer. If a mixture of compounds is taken, we get absurd and meaningless data. Many explosives do not exhibit a problems in the region. Microaromatics can be analyzed. Some visible spectroscopic methods are developed. It's generally useful in the quality control and process control in the industry and in the military. Replaced by superior chromatography. IR spectroscopy is very useful as an identification tool, not for quantification, but it can be done quantification, but more it is used for the identification. IR spectrum between 4000 to 250 cm inverse is scanned as a whole molecule, fingerprint below 1300 cm inverse. Specific function groups above 15, above 1500 cm one hour. 
purification and micro devices necessary. Micro aromatics, we have C NO2 stitching of NO2 1590 to 1510 cm inverse and 30. These are the specific bands which we can find in C NO2 micro aromatics. If aromatic ring is present, we will see bands at 1560, 1520 and 1370, 1340 and uh, for dinitro compounds we have specific frequencies are given 1550 to 1539, 1567 to 4 TNT, strong bands and 1534 and 1534. So but clearly we can identify this thing. This is a, a PIR uh, spectrometer. Next. And these are the IR spectra of some of the explosives. PATP, TNT, ammonium nitrate, and on the left side. Then for nitrate esters, we have NO2 stretching vibrations at CO, NO2, 1660, 1640, and like that. Most often, the interpretation of these IR spectra is difficult as they are similar because all of them are having similar groups. Nitramines. That is RDX and all that. They can be NNO2 is there and no stitching is there. So those are the frequencies is there. A Raman spectroscopy is also used as a complementary technique, but in the forensic laboratory, Raman spectroscopy is not being used, but it should be used because the forensic laboratory look for uh, use of instruments which are useful uh, for many other things like drugs, etc. So uh, they should have Raman spectroscopy. And latest technique in the Raman spectroscopy. Uh, as it is, we can use Raman spectroscopy, but we can also use surface enhanced Raman res uh, resonance Raman spectroscopy, which is very useful as a non-destructive tool for the analysis of explosive traces. Next. Post explosion analysis, recovery method, microscopic examination, head space sampling, adsorption, and extraction, liquid liquid extraction, and solid phase extraction. These are the methods by means of which we extract the explosion residue. First, we do screening and then we do the confirmation. Method used depend on the sophistication and the analytical scenes available in the forensic laboratory. So we will uh, discuss uh, very fast chemical test. Chemical test, spot color test based on the reaction between an analyte and a reagent. These are commonly done in the most of the explosive laboratories. Uh, they are presumptive screening or field tests, uh, which are to be confirmed by other chromatographic methods. There are various reactions which are color reactions, which are known as Meisenheimer reactions for TNT, which use the pink color. And the grease reaction is very common, which is used in ballistics also. And for RDX, TETN, and nitrate and is pink color, diphenylamine test, peroxides, and dark blue, aniline sulfate test, for chlorate, which is a dark blue. Next. Nestle's reagent for TNT and ammonium is gives red, uh, red orange chloride, uh, white precipitate, and then perchlorate uh, reagent, perchlorate ion reagent, purple color. So these are uh, what are the advantages and limitation of the uh, these tests? Uh, they are though fast, they are not very complex, simple, no instrumentation. No instrumentation, but uh, it's still inexpensive. But there are a lot of limitations. No basis for reliable identification. It has to be confirmed. Only indicative or presumptive tests are there. Now, extraction and cleanup for a better analytical analysis. Aqueous and organic extraction is done. Um, then first with acetone and then with water we do and then acetone extract is examined for the organic constituents and uh, water extract is analyzed for the uh, inorganic ones.
and there is a chart flow chart available based on the these are the aqueous and organic cleanup based on absorption on a solid proper subsequent dilution is the carbon free to use as resins xid2 xid4 xid7 xid18 which is used in the hpmc then phenol cyanophases we use for the cleanup so that only explodes it then poropash tea chlorophyll then solid phase micro extraction nowadays is being used uh, the solvent which is used is 65 micrometer polyethylene glycol like pdvp or 85 micrometer on silica fiber adsorbent thermally so the silica fiber is made of all these things and then it is absorbed and dissolved for analysis directly into a dc or a phase these are the modern techniques which have come then um, so what is called super critical um, analysis super critical fluid extraction carbon dioxide at uh, uh, as a solvent at high pressure 5000 psi at 50 degrees then it will be able to extract the uh, other uh, all the ingredients chromatographic technique is a, essentially a separation based on the difference in affinity of components to uh, stationary phase and the mobile phase. Chromatographic behavior expressed by migration rates, rate of flow, RF for the tension types. Next question. Identification and quantitation by comparing with the authentic standard part. So we will have to go fast because the technique which is used is singular chromatography. This is uh, um, stationary phases and mobile phases visualization, preparative PLC. Sensitivity is microgram to sub microgram. Many mobile phases, no single system can separate all explosives. Therefore, a combination, therefore, a combination is used. Most ideal one is you have to do three times PLC. Using 1 2 dichloroethylene acetone and acetone and dichloroethylene acetone, uh, petroleum ether. Yeah. If you do in all these three, all the explosives will be completely different. There is no single um, system which can separate all explosives. Then, utilization is done. The PLC plates are seen in UV light, then spraying with grease reagent, diphenylamide, aniline sulfate, and now some new reagent. Fluorescent reagents also have come. Uh, so, other solvent systems from the literature are given here because you will get this the, uh, uh, what do you call it, and you can note down from that. Visualization for nitrate is certain at time. Similarly, the same grease reagent and TNT tetrile reaction is based 30% solution of 3P prime. And we know this propylamine in Philadelphia. So many of these are not being followed regularly in the forensic laboratories. TNT, NG, RDX, TN, diphenylamine, 1% in ethanol stone. They are then UV radiation. And sometimes then blue color will appear. Distinction between propellant and non propellant radiation. Uh, So there is a propellant grade C and non-propellant. Nitrocellulose uh, comes in two forms, propellant grade and non-propellant. The propellant grain is uh, dangerous, which is used in explosives, whereas non-propellant grain is used in the commercial operation, commercial preparations like you know nail paint, etc. Or uh, uh, Birmingham, there was a blast in a tube railway where two people were caught, uh, their hand wash gave breezy and positive color. And that positive color, they said that they were handling the explosive. That's what they were put behind the bar. But they tried and told that they were not, they are not handling the explosive. But just because of the grease reaction to the washings of their hands, they were put behind the bar. 
but later after 8 years and a lawyer came into the court and the lawyer argued upon that that they were playing cards in the train the cards playing cards have got writers to lose behind them and that got transferred by the local principal and that's how they got these things so how to distinguish between an explosive uh, break and uh, non explosive break like the commercial playing cards so after 8 uh, years they were released so uh, uh, who are in the prison they were released so this was a miscarriage of justice uh, which had happened at that time this distinction between the proper and the non proper in uh, this thing there is a two dimensional tlc method also available next next automated hp tlc Uh, with a gradient, no finish. Gradient, gradient, ether and ethyl acid, methanol, ethyl acid, etc. Pass the topic. So this is the experimentation of HPTLC. HPTLC is more efficient uh, than the TLC because of the obvious. Particle size uh, uniformity and particle size minimal particle size. You know, this is uh, HPTLC chromatogram after scanning. Now well, this is about the HPLC. So uh, here the details are given. What are the columns? Uh, statement, statement, phase. We have to use. Normally, we use non-polar, diphenyl five percent, diphenyl fifteen, ninety percent, copolymer, DB five, HB five, SP five, twenty-five meters, fourteen feet. Typical conditions. This is for DC injection, one eighty degrees column program, uh, uh, linear temperature program in column fifty degrees. Fast flow on short columns, useful for nitro mines. But generally, though the conditions are given here before the advent of HPLC, we are supposed to use the HPC. But many of the explosives will decompose at high temperatures. You see columns, therefore, uh, they are not preferred. The advent of HPLC, most people are using only HPLC. One thing I will tell you in this. A particular um, detector is uh, 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 what do you call uh, prepared for the exclusively for explosives, uh, which is of course used in food industry also, uh, but for some time. But no other purpose is solved because it uh, detects the nitro compounds. What is known as thermal energy analyzer or chemiluminescent analyzer, uh, which is based on Uh, principle that the that the detector is a compound. This is a typical of a gas chromatograph. Next, gas chromatograph. These are the gas chromatogram for explosives. Next, next. The columns which are used are given. Next. We'll pass on the PPTs so you can know the details. We are running short of time, so uh, EEA thermal energy analyzer is something new, other than the normal gas chromatography, uh, about which we tell now. Uh, this is uh, EEA or thermal. It's a nitrogen specific detector, so nitro compounds only can detect. So they get pyrolyzed. Nitrogen compounds will get pyrolyzed to oxides of nitrogen, and these are sent into the reaction chamber where ozone is produced. Ozone will uh, react with them and excite the nitro group. So asterisk is put there. This asterisk is put there. So now this particular activated oxide of nitrogen. When it uh, decays to ground state from the excited state, 
it will release energy in the form of infrared, uh, which can be measured in the point 6 to point 2.8 uh, uh, region. So light intensity is uh, there, and this micro compound concentration can be determined. And the funniest thing about this is. So therefore, the uh, funny thing about is, this is one de detector which can be used both in the GC and HPLC. So next. These are the pictures of HPLC. Previous slide we have shown the, what are the columns which are used. Next. Now mass spectrometry is the most useful and uh, very good for confirmation and uh, MS alone suitable for identification and structure illustration of fly explosives in um, EI and CI and NCI uh, mode. So GCMS useful to a limited extent because of the thermoliral nature and low vapor pressure, useful for micro aromatics. But other explosives have also been utilized. EI mass spectrometry of nitroglycerin, PETN are similar, but they can be differentiated by their presentation times in EI and GCMS. These are pictures of GCMS. And as GC is not used much, Similarly, GCMS is not being used. So now LCMS is being widely used because of the milder condition than GCMS. So thermospray LCMS in negative ion mode, 200 picogram. Electrospray ionization we can use in negative mode ion mode, 5 to 10 picogram. Next. Standard mass spectrometry, that is MSMS, it consists of ion source to mass analogy. This is about the principles cell between them and a detector. Ions, they are mass separated in first mass analyzer, a precursor parent ion focused into a collision cell, selected ion collides with the uh, helium, and then collision induced dissociation, which we call it as KD, gets. Any fragmented ions must analyze by the second mass analyzer and record it. This is very useful. Um, LCMS and MSMS. The secondary mass spectra are called daughter ion spectrum or fragment ion uh, spectrum provides a uh, primary ion beam. A MSMS instrument and both in four modes. Details are given. Most useful <laughs> techniques are providing additional information. Yes. This is uh, uh, supercritical fluid chromatography is also used. This is a part of a combination of GC and LC and uh, it can run at room temperature and we uh, generally the carbon dioxide is used as a mobile fluid. Yes. If we have the instrument we can use most of the product we do not have this instrument. So the detector, conductivity detector is used. Next. So many instruments can be used. Now capillary electrophysics is another instrument which can be used. The principles are explained in this particular uh, slide. The beauty of this is both inorganic explosives and organic explosives can be analyzed by this uh, and a very small quantity. Here UV detector is used uh, with a capillary uh, electrophoresis. This is a separation technique. So next, this is a photograph of a capillary electrophoresis. Next, C is able to analyze different classes of compounds, organic and inorganic, neutral, and ionic are simply changing the buffer. Sensitivity is picogram range, and then 
drone and uh, this is suitable method for ion. Any case is suitable for neutral ion. So two methods, capillary zone electrophoresis. Okay. So they have given. Now latest is C is coupled with mass spectrometry. Uh, CEMS has been developed. It will prove to be very useful in the coming years. Okay. Oh, thank you. Uh, I have made a very quick and uh, exceeded the time given by the organizers, but still, um, I have done whatever could be done in the given uh, period of time. The residue analysis requires many uh, instrumentation techniques, depending on what instruments you are having in your laboratory, you can use. Many of the instruments are common for toxicology and other things. So, same instruments can be used for the explosive. It is the discretion of the chemist who is analyzing which instrument should be used. Because normally qualitative analysis is required in the residue analysis. No quantitation is required. For geographical origin, only you require the quantitative analysis or profile. So I am sorry for the speed with which I have gone. Because the, the time given is so short and the subject is very wide. As I told you, uh, we conduct 30 hours for this. So, thank you very much. And uh, if any questions are there, I will be glad to answer them. Dear yeah, participants, just a minute. Dear participant, you are allowed to ask the questions. One by one, please unmute your mics, then ask the questions. Yeah. Uh, hello, sir. I am Dr. Priyanka Munjal. Uh, sir, my question is, uh, is FSL using NMR as the uh, identification tool for uh, explosive detection? Uh, as I, uh, excuse me. As, as I told, uh, I mean, a lot of disturbance. Uh, others, please switch off their mics. So that I can answer the question. Sir, they are unmuted, sir. Not to worry, sir. You can answer, huh. sir. So the uh, NMR can be used, especially when you synthesize explosives or in the industry where the manufacturing process is going on, NMR can be done. And NMR, as far as the analytical sensitivity is concerned, quantitation, etc., is not having that much of sensitivity than other analytic techniques which have which we have at our disposal. And uh, it is very complicated and uh, if impurities are present, there will be problems in that. So NMR is not a preferred technique for the forensic analysis of explosion residues. The amount of sample required is also more. So therefore, we generally do not use it. Where you are engaged in the synthesis of explosives or production of explosives, their NMR is a tool for the identification and looking for the impurities when you do profiling of that. NMR cannot be used in the forensic setup. It is advisable. We have used NMR once, once or twice in research work, etc. But in the regular routine practice, in most of the laboratories all over the world, um, the NMR is not regularly used. Then, next question. I think you are satisfied. Dear participant, Thank any questions? Hello, I am Please. Karta. Yes, yes sir. Yes. I am KPS Karta. I am retired director CFSL Hyderabad. Uh, actually, the sir has given a very good presentation, particularly for the uh, new uh, scientists, but uh, I have two, three observations, sir. Yes. Uh, one is that uh, regarding the TEA, thermal energy analyzer, yes. uh, when it is used along with the HPLC, there is a problem. You have to use uh, liquid nitrogen to uh, get the minus 70 degrees Celsius for the uh, ions to catch in the HPLC uh, columns. Yes. So that is a very difficult task because we have to use liquid nitrogen along with ethanol. So yes. that is a 
mixing of this ethanol along with the uh, liquid nitrogen it is very dangerous hazardous so, hazardous uh, hazardous so it is uh, not advisable sir that is one thing yeah. and second thing one of the instruments i think you might have uh, missed that is ion chromatography yeah. so for inorganic ions by yeah. only by doing the uh, chemical analysis will not serve the purpose Yeah. So we should also switch over to ion chromatograph, which is exactly, one. exactly, uh, very, very uh, useful for uh, inorganic ions, particularly oxidases and uh, yes. fuels. Well. Uh, for that, uh, you can use this uh, ion chromatograph. Yes. Yes. So otherwise, you have given a very good uh, presentation. It is very clear and it is very good. And only a uh, one observation is that as British, the slides were there. I think uh, that can uh, could have been avoided. Yeah, so yeah. Th- thank you very much sir oh, oh mr kapa i am aware of this uh, uh, thermal energy analyzer or thermal <laughs> emission analyzer the problem gc it works very well whereas uh, hplc has got this problem but they are still being used in this yeah, hplc diode array detector is uh, fine because you can also get the uv yeah. uh, detection yeah. along with the um, uh, separation by hplc it's uh, working fine and uh, also right. lc ms ms is very good yes. provided you have the interpretation because uh, it does not have the uh, uh, database library yeah. so you should have the mrm and uh, product ion uh, identification uh, you have to have the knowledge of the interpretation so that is the thing otherwise lc ms ms is also a very good technique sir now but uh, these instrument uh, this uh, chemical luminescence was uh, developed uh, before the development of lc ms and ms so uh, that's why at that point of time it was one of the sort of yeah the, yeah but uh, the uh, ta uh, another one more problem is that it is giving only analog si- signals yes, so yes. again you should uh, use a converter to so convert digital digital, digital signals yes. so those problems are there because i have experienced this uh, yeah i know ta detector yeah, yeah. Yeah, very good. So, uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, nowadays, as I told uh, in the concluding part, uh, that uh, LCMS is the best one. A uh, preferably LCMS MS is the best one for doing these things. As far as the ion chromatography is concerned, actually, I skipped uh, some slides because of the time constraint. Where I have given initially, I told ion chromatography. <coughs> I mean, uh, ion mobility spectrometry and ion chromatography. Ion chromatography is very useful for the inorganic analysis. If you are having a HPLC instrument, you can carry out the ion yeah. chromatography of uh, inorganic constituent, especially in the countrymade bombs, uh, etc., where um, uh, this uh, ammonium nitrate and uh, this uh, potassium chlorate and all these stuff. So. And the beauty of the ion chromatography is that both anions and cations can be analyzed on the instrument and get a correct picture and even the profile of the explosive. That is very much yeah, 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 yeah. Sulfide, all those things can be. Analyzed. Okay, sir. Well said, sir. I, I skipped in the slides where I mean, did I skip some slides because of the time constraint in which it was uh, given. Ion mobility spectrometry is also good technique, but it's only a screening technique, which requires further confirmation. It was used on the airports, etc., where ion mobility spectrometry is there, but it cannot be a conclusive technique. So, whereas MS LC MS MS is uh, very useful. And now, so many other instruments are also e- even available. for cation analysis. You can use uh, ICP AES also. Yeah, that that also. So, just like she told about NMR, almost all the instruments can be used based on whether you are doing inorganic analysis or organic analysis. But availability of that instrument in the forensic laboratory is a, a matter of concern, and uh, forensic laboratory. Looks that one instrument purchase can I... be used both for toxicology or for drug analysis or something. It can be used for many purposes. That uh, instrument is preferred. Therefore, commonly available. What are the instruments in the forensic laboratory based on that? For any instrumental technique based on the inorganic and organic method, it can be used for the explosive. It has been used in the method. Yes. 
you have participated any questions mm-hmm. one by one you can unmute your mic and then you can ask the questions okay excuse me sir i am rashmi gupta yes sir uh, can uh, sir tlc can be the confirmative tool for the exclusive residual analysis well this is a question in india most of the forensic laboratories are doing only spot tests and the tlc yes sir uh, provided you use a authentic standard along with uh, this tlc along with your sample if you are using an authentic standard and uh, you are doing the analysis in two solvent systems okay sir uh, in one solvent system you no. must get a positive result and in the second also the rf values will change and there mm-hmm. also you should get the same then it could be considered as a confirmative method of analysis when you don't have gc at pc and other instruments but you must do in the two solvent system because okay. by accident what happens two explosives may give the same rf value in one solvent system but mm-hmm. in the other solvent system it will give different rf values therefore that is a very good uh, method provided i um, mean in case you are having difficulty of having the instruments mm-hmm. Yeah. And then U U V can be used for the residual analysis. U V spectro. No, no, U V is not very useful because you require one is more quantity, and also you require very pure sample. If any okay. impurity comes, then the spectrum which you get will be nonsensical spectrum. So you yes. cannot, yeah, unless you purify it. So in the residues, normally very small amount is there. You cannot purify as many groups of preparative samples. Therefore, U V is not useful in the case of residue analysis. It is useful in the quality control in the manufacture live explosive. Okay, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone? Thank you. Sir. Anyone? Anyone want to want to ask a questions? Yes, sir. Hello, good afternoon. Hello. ha uh, tell me yavardi control option heart lot of disturbance hello hello ask your question please hello i want to ask uh, what is the best technique to detect plastic explosives uh, plastic explosive is not an explosive plastic is a ingredient which is put in the explosive like you know, mostly in the rdx they put a polymer which we call it as a plastic explosive so rdx uh, we have already given that first you do spot test uh, for the rdx you know this reagent is uh, this thing color and another reagent nucleus reagent also gives the color then you go to tlc and uh, the solvent system is all given in the literature and then you do the hplc it gives the best results and if you have a ms you do lcms it is the best so it all depends how much of accuracy you want and whether you are having instruments or not so methods are available for the analysis plastic explosive means what happens is you have to extract into acetone So in the acetone, RDX will come, and that acetone solution you should carry out uh, to the, the color test and PLC and then HPLC and then LCMS. The perfection is that many laboratories in India are giving based on the color test and the PLC. But when you are doing PLC, as I told you earlier. you have to do in two solvent system now hptlc also has come which gives you some spectra aromatic compounds are there then you get a good uv spectra in the hptls thank you thank you sir welcome uh, neha jain you can ask your questions unmute you can ask a questions uh, hello sir i want to ask that in n4 what percentage of ammonium nitrate is used as an explosive as it is also used as a fertilizer 
see, generally, you know, 95% of ammonium nitrate and 5% of fuel oil is used uh, in the composition. And okay. it varies, the fuel oil percentage varies. Some people use more also, but 5% uh, this thing and 95% ammonium nitrate uh, will explode very nicely with the uh, detonator put it in the gel form, liquid form, etc. Uh, with oil mixed, etc. You can use jellies and all that. You can use it. Ammonium nitrate. The fertilizer uh, grade explosive uh, is uh, uh, not used in the commercial antho explosives, but if uh, terrorists if they use fertilizer, maybe a little more or less because there is, they will never measure and all that. Simply they will add the fuel oil. Okay. So you have to identify the fuel oil and you have to identify the ammonium ions and the nitrate ions. And by ion chromatography, you can estimate actually how much ammonium is there and how much ammonium nitrate is there. You can estimate. And uh, fuel oil you can identify by GC. Uh, and uh, yes, yes, please. Neha, you can ask your question. Uh, what are the why is this breaking? Uh, what are the different components present in the fuel oil that can be used uh, while forming a mixture and food? Oh, no, fuel oil, as you know, it is a petroleum compound. It's a multi-component mixture of several hydrocarbons and uh, other uh, um, aromatics and aliphatics, etc. Which are, uh, you know, um, you know, methylenes and acetylenes and all that. Uh, so, uh, it's a multi-component mixture. So, okay, only, no. only the, when uh, you want, suppose suspect will be having the fuel oil in your house. So, if the composition is caught live, then you can extract that oil in some solvent and then you do GC. And do GC of the seized bottle, which is uh, new, and compare the GC, then it will match very nicely. Because of the because there are about 250 300 peaks you will get in that because several compounds will be saturated or <coughs> saturated and uh, all those compounds you will get and some aromatics also higher because higher hydrocarbons uh, high volume uh, liquids are used so some aromatics will also be there so by uh, profiling the you see that compare the pure oil. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Very nice and informative presentation. Welcome, sir. welcome. Dear uh, next, Ria, you can. Yes, sir, you can take, sir. Yeah. Vika, sir? Yes, yeah. sir. Thank you very much. Bolivika, sir. sir anyone else Vika, sir, wants start to today. ask a question or if anyone have any queries? No, uh, sir, uh, excuse. Yes, you can sir? ask, that's me. Yes, sir. Sir, ammonium nitrate is categorized in which category, sir? Low explosive or secondary high explosive? Is high explosive. Secondary high, sir? Huh. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, anyone have any queries? Uh, can I substantiate? I am Karta here. Yeah, yeah sir. Uh, this ammonium nitrate, there is a special rule, is there? Ammonium nitrate rule of 2012 is there. Yes. Sir. So, in that, uh, the category of ammonium nitrate is categorized uh, specifically. If it is less than 40%, that is designated as a uh, fertilizer grade, and more than 40% of ammonium nitrate is categorized as expl explosive grade in the ammonium nitrate rules. Uh, 2012. Mm. Um, because of this uh, velocity based, uh, it is high explosive. But, uh, but, but uh, the, the differentiation in the fertilizer grade and explosive grade. So the rule is there already. Well, then you have to do the quantitative 
analysis yeah 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 very correct sir very correct <laughs> Okay, dear participants, anyone have more queries? <coughs> Sir, we, we think we should conclude this session for today. Sir, I have, I have one question. Uh, Sir, uh, many times we have seen in the paper, explosives will be detected by the adduct formation in MS. Yeah. That adduct, uh, uh, like uh, without adduct formation, they generally they does not give uh, MS spectra. Mm -hmm. So kindly give you some your view about that. Just like any other chemical analysis, adduct formations use just like a derivative formation. So when you do the analysis, you can do the analysis of the parent compound. Or you can derivatize it into some other compound and then do it, then sensitivity is increased. Or some of the compounds which are not giving the spectra, they are derivatized into the spectra. So similarly, the adduct formation gives the capability of giving the spectrum in a better way. That is why adducts are used. Many examples are real in general chemistry also. Derivative spectra uh, we get in this thing. Many, many examples are there where we convert into derivatization. We do for DC also. We yeah, derivatize. Sir, if we determine TNT in a positive mode, then it will not come. But in a, yeah. a negative mode, it will come in a very good peak. Yes, yes. Yes. Why it is? Oh, it is a physical chemistry question. It all depends on the charges on the molecule, which are there. Mostly nitrogen has got a positive charge. Based on that only, uh, the separation will take place. So based on that, the negative ion mode you will get a better spectrum. So that is why we, I have shown you in my slides that negative ion mode also, you have to do it sometimes. For that reason only I have shown. Okay, okay. thank you so much. Sir. Okay, dear participants, anyone have more queries? Sir, we should conclude this session for the today, sir. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. We should conclude this session for the today, sir. Yes, thank you, sir. Yes. Thank you so much for thank your you. valuable experience thank and imparting the knowledge in the field of forensic science and in the field of explosive and explosion residue. I'm thanking you in behalf of my team and from all the participants. We are getting a huge response from the participants and invaluable feedback from the participants. And thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Oh, welcome. Only thing is uh, because of the uh, limitation of time, I just yes, could not do full justice to this subject. So, yes, sir, yes, sir. Okay. Because of the heterogeneous nature of the audience, I had to give some basics about the explosive which consumed a lot of time. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. <coughs> Sir, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation, sir. We have a great experience in the yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for a patient hearing. Thank you.